Here's a 3D CAD drawing of what I have made. Each wheel is going to have three parts. It's got this one, two, three, and this blue part is going to represent the wheel itself. It's not the actual entire wheel, obviously. It's just the part that these parts are going to mate with. On the back, we have a steel disc that I made out of some random circles that I had laying around. It's going to have an M20 by one in the center threading. It is big enough to get through this opening here that's highlighted, but too big to get past this point. So that is the back side of the wheel. On the front, I have the aluminum center cap. And what it does here, we got a little shoulder right here that's highlighted. That's gonna go through and fit inside the circle. This bigger part highlighted here is big enough to go into here, this part, but not to get past this part. This bolt on the front is going to go through this 20 millimeter opening through the center cap and then thread into the back side on my little backer plate. Sandwiching it all together and should secure it quite well. Let's get to making these backer plates. They started out their life as discards from a metal supplier who cut it out with a laser. And then I buy them in these useful shapes for about 75 cents a pound. One of the most difficult things to do when you're putting something in a lathe is finding a way to actually put it in the lathe so you can turn it. I want to be able to turn the outside of this disc to the proper diameter, but I can't because the only way I can hold it is in the jaws. So what I'm going to do is increase the diameter of the center here to a half of an inch so I can put it on a half inch arbor. The arbor that I made is just some 5 8 inch round stock. I turned the end to a half of an inch and then put half 20 threads on the end so I could lock it into place. I need to turn this metal disc down to the right diameter. Right now it was cut out with a laser so that part there, anytime metal gets super hot and melty and then cools down again, it's very difficult to machine and it becomes very hard. So I had to take it very carefully there. After deburring, I had to test this out to make sure that it fit inside the wheel and I left it a little loose on purpose so that I can ensure, depending on corrosion, that they were going to fit in all four wheels. I need to thread the inside of this disc to an M20 by 1 thread, which meant that I needed to turn this to roughly 19 millimeters. I had already done one of the previous discs, so I left the settings of the machine alone and just did a plunge cut. Now that the center of the disc is the right diameter, I can use this M20 by 1 tap to put threads on the inside of the disc. One of the more difficult parts about using a tap is ensuring that the threads go in straight and that the tap goes in straight. So if you have a lathe, it's really nice to be able to use the tailstock to center the end of your tap to ensure that it goes in straight. I'm never going to see these discs once installed, so I just cheaped out and just used the easiest way to put a whole lot of paint on something in the least amount of effort possible. I cut out some aluminum squares on my bandsaw. I'm using the four jaw chuck, which all act independently of one another, to appropriately align the center of this workpiece with the tailstock. I'm going to put a half inch hole like I did before in this workpiece. This is so I can turn the square into a circle later. Currently it's being held in place by the jaws of the chuck, and I can't turn the outside. So here it is, a half of an inch, just like before. I had to measure my wheel so I knew what diameter these circles needed to be. And then I marked that out on the square piece and cut off the corners in order to avoid a long tedious process of turning them off on the lathe. I mounted my piece in the arbor so that I could get a perfect circle once I turned this down. But first, it's going to take a little while to get these corners off and resolve in a non-interrupted cut and then get it down to the appropriate diameter for the wheel. 
The buzzing sound that you hear is because it's an interrupted cut, it means that it's not being cut continuously. Every time it spins around, there's portions that are not being cut because the diameter is too small at that part. This cut that I'm making here is more for cosmetics than anything else. I don't actually have to do it, but I think it'll make it look nicer. I flip the workpiece around, and I'm going to use my compound to cut a shoulder on the backside that's 200,000 steep. This is my compound all the way forward, and it's about 190 thousandths gap. So I want to add 200 thousandths to that measurement. So right now it's at 390. Then I put the workpiece in. And then I slide my tool all the way to touching the face. And then I lock the carriage lock in place. Now when I extend that compound all the way forward, it's going to cut pretty close to 200,000 steep, probably within a thousandth or two. And I can repeat this with all four. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a final facing of the front, the part that people are going to be able to see once it's on the wheel. And also I'm going to get it so that each piece is a uniform thickness of approximately a little under 3 eighths. With all the edge machining done, I can now put the piece back in the jaws of the chalk without the arbor, and I can bore out the center to just a little over 20 millimeters so I can put the bolt that I'm going to be making through the center. The part that I'm machining now is just a little recess for the bolt to go into. I'm going to make it about one and a quarter because I'm going to be working with one and a quarter inch hex stock and then I'm going to put a 30 degree chamfer on it to make it look a little nicer. I set my compound to 30 degrees and I'm going to use that for the travel back and forth. I'm going to set my depth of cut using the cross feed. Once I'm done with this one, I'll note how far that traveled and then I'll do that on the remaining three so they all look identical. It's time to make some bolts and what better way to make bolts than hex stock. So this is one and a quarter inch aluminum hex stock. Right here I'm just going to face it after it being cut with a bandsaw. I'm going to use the same trick as I did before and set the compound to 600 thousandths. And then I'm going to turn it down to 20 millimeters. Right now I'm just cleaning up the shoulder there with a small facing cut. This part is going to interface with the center cap and if you remember that had a 30 degree chamfer on it so I'm going to put a 30 degree chamfer on this one as well. Alright, now to put some M20 by 1 millimeter pitch threads into this bolt. Right there, I just zeroed it out, and I'm going to make a little scratch pass right here and see how it looks. And then after this, I'm just going to keep going with uh, adding a little bit of depth of cut until the threads are formed. 
When threading, you use a custom combination of gears to make the travel of the carriage linked to the rotation of the headstock. In this case, one millimeter per revolution of the headstock. And that cannot be disconnected, otherwise your thread will start in a different place in relation to what you've already cut. It is for that reason I have to make the machine go backwards to actually get it to go right. This is a nut that I made from the exact same hex stock. I threaded it to an M20 thread, same as the bolt, and it's what I'm going to use to turn this piece from now on because I can't actually put it in the chuck without ruining the threads. This is possible because it is a right-handed thread. As the cutter cuts, the only thing it can possibly do to the piece inside the headstock is tighten that bolt into the nut. It can't actually come loose. Really getting close to done. Here I am just putting a 30 degree chamfer on this side so it makes it look a little nicer. This is the last step, apart from drilling a 5 8 inch hole just to make it look nicer as well. What I'm doing is I'm just putting a 60 degree face on part of the bolt and this is mostly just for cosmetics. All right, let's get to anodizing. We gotta start by uh, getting these things nice and squeaky clean. I'm just using some simple green here and the cheapo toothbrush is brand new. I just bought six for a dollar. I like to do a little bit of chemical extraction and uh, physical extraction. And the wire is titanium wire. You can reuse it over and over again. And once I'm done with this, I'm just going to spray it down with some distilled water. I have the wire connected already because it's just really kind of difficult to do it after. There's, there might be a little bit of oil or dirt on the wire. And you manipulate the wire and then you gotta touch your part and then that's bad. So all right. So that's pretty clean. Actually it's people say it's the hardest part, but I don't really think so. I just have a colander so that uh, it doesn't sit in its own filth when I put it back down. It's got to keep track of which one I'm cleaning. I'm going to clean the other three. All right, time to dunk them in some acid here. We just got a sulfuric acid bath here. And I'm going to spray them off one more time with some distilled water. And I need to check the connection really pretty well. We don't want to have it either fall off in the bottom of the bucket, which is a major pain in the ass, and then two, just uh, not having any good contact, and you just spent two hours anodizing something that didn't do anything. And you had to wait another two hours for it to finish, so I'm just gonna tighten this up. There's one. All right, so as you can see, I have uh, all the parts in there. And I need to set up my aeration or just my agitation here. This is basically just uh, some PVC with holes in it hooked up to an aquarium pump. Puts off a lot of bubbles and the bubbles aren't really the point. It's just mostly that it, the bubbles are gonna agitate the liquid here and keep the uh, temperature a little bit uh, stable. Here we go. All right, so here's my positive lead. My negative lead is already attached to a piece of aluminum inside the bath. And that one is negative. The parts are positive. And get up my power supply here, see what it's set to. 
Uh, giving the surface area of about 70 inches uh, square. I'm going to put it up to about 3 amps for 2 hours to put 1 mil thick, which is basically a thousandth of an inch. All right. All right, so it just started, and you can see some uh, stuff happening. There's some gas bubbles and stuff floating around and uh, some other junk. And it's going to take two hours, so I'll come back to it. Time to mix up some dye while this stuff is going on. And then I'm going to get out of here because I don't like the smell of this stuff. It's not very good for you either. But So I'm going to have an empty bottle right here. Just going to tear it. And I'm going to weigh new one. 243 grams for the contents inside. I got uh, a half gallon I'm going to mix up, and this goes one bottle for two. So I want 25% of uh, 242, which is uh, 61 grams approximately. And that's going tear all right see how I can get 61 grams how close I can right there good all right Close enough. All right, let's get this in here. This stuff will really stain your fingers, so if you have any on your fingers, don't get it wet. All right. There goes that. I have some of this liquid nickel acetate. It's a sealer, so after you dye it, you dunk it in this stuff for a while. And I'm going to make up a gallon of it. So I'm going to tear this. I'm going to turn it on. All right, so it is 12. 75, which is uh, what 637, right around there for half of it. All right, so it's. I don't know why it's oh, I don't have the cap on. That's why. Put the cap right here. There we go. All right. So what I need to do, I'm gonna mix this up, shake it up a little. I'm going to try not to spill any all over my scale. Yep, overload. 73. It's kind of green colored. I wasn't expecting that. You could also do the boiling method of sealing it. I just want to give this a try because it seems like it's a better idea. I wasn't too fond of the results with boiling. Pretty close, good enough. So now I'm gonna pour it into my jug. Here. All right, so in this, I'm gonna put my liquid nickel acetate. In this one, I'm going to put my dye. 
it's only been, I don't know, half an hour since I started my energizing. So I still got an hour and a half to wait. So once I get this in here, I'm gonna leave the garage so I don't have to smell this stuff. I'm gonna pour enough in here so that uh, it's enough to cover my parts while they're hanging. And the thermometers are for getting the right temperature of the dye and the liquid ni ni nickel acetate. That's a mouthful. That's what she said. All right, so now I have my dye. Pour it in my other one. There we go. Obviously, the more you have in there, the longer it takes to heat up. So I don't need to load it to the brim. I'm just going to pour them back into their containers after I'm done. All right, so right now it's just idle time. In about an hour or so, I'm going to come back and then turn the heat on for both of these and get them to the right temperature. And then we'll be ready to uh, dip and seal. I'm ready to uh, start coloring. What I'm going to do is going to add some baking soda. This is just some baking soda to one of these. Yeah, that's a lot of baking soda. Doesn't matter that much. And then I'm just going to stir it up. Okay, now I'm ready to start taking them out of the acid. You can't see it over here, but it's really not that exciting, anyways. I have my just distilled water in a spray bottle and I'm going to just spray as much of the acid off in the tank as I, as I can here. And then I'm going to put it into my baking soda solution and get rid of any hint of acid that was ever there after the spray down. You usually tell because a little gas will come off if there's any on there. Okay, that was my baking soda solution. And then this is just plain water. Reverse osmosis water. You could use distilled. I just had, uh, I have one of those things in my kitchen. So, all right, so I'm just gonna note the time on my watch here. I'm gonna try to leave it in for about six minutes. And my temperature is about 150 right now. This one's at about 165. All right, so this one's been in for about five or six minutes. I'm gonna try to spray off as much of this dye as I can. And I can add a little water to this because a lot of it says uh, evaporated out. So I can bring it back to somewhat of its uh, original concentration. And then I don't want to get any of this dye in my uh, see, nitric or whatever that stuff is. All right, rinsing it off really well. You can see it turned out pretty nice. And I'm going to put it in here for probably 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Oh, I dropped one. That happens. See if I can get it out. I was sticking my hand in there. And it's pretty hot. This is what they don't show you in those videos. This is what you're gonna Yeah. Just wait till it falls in. All right. Gotta be a man. Just pull this out. Ugh, throw a glove on so I don't get my finger all dyed. Ah, it's hot. Too deep. So yeah, finally got it out. All right. All right, so they've been in there slightly different amounts of time, but uh, I'm sure they're probably well sealed by now. So looking pretty good. 